Yeah, so if you're not, it's sort of a Bluetooth, the, the Amazon Echo is a Bluetooth speaker that's outfitted with a bunch of microphones. So it has no screen. It's kind of like a disembodied Siri, right? So Siri without the phone, you can just kind of talk to it. Um, and I do a lot of chatting with both the Alexa in my house, she sits in my kitchen, I call her a she, which is a little weird to me, um, and I kind of yell out commands <laughs> to her. I ask her about the weather, I ask her what time it is, my um, kids ask her all sorts of questions I don't know the answer to about state capitals. Okay, I know state capitals. Let's, let's pretend I'm more knowledgeable about state capitals than I am. Um, I do a lot of chatting with bots like this. So this is um, Poncho. This is a bot on Facebook Messenger. And Poncho tells me about the weather. I get a notification every morning from Poncho. And every evening, because I'm a runner, um, Poncho sends me my running outlook for the following day. So what, what I can expect while I'm running. Um, this is another bot that I interact with a lot. It's called Epitome. It's not pronounced epitome. Sometimes I get corrected on the spot, but it's not. I talk to them. <laughs> um, it is a fashion bot, yes. Sure, yeah. Okay. This is a Facebook Messenger bot. Okay. Yeah, there's a little symbol up in the top. Right, yeah, this is a Facebook Messenger bot. The onboarding here is pretty sophisticated. Onboarding is like your first interaction that you have with a bot, right? Um, and it asks you a bunch of questions about what you have in your wardrobe. And then every morning it sends you outfit options based on what you have. Um, and it pulls these from um, Instagram. So it has both sort of uh, editorial content around fashion, um, tells you about things like the little black dress or sneakers or that kind of thing, um, as well as pulls photos of this type of look from Instagram, suggests, so it's, so it's a blend of editorial content and sort of what I would call true bot, right? And that the bot is actually pulling from Instagram into the feed. This is my uh, assistant. His name is Andrew Ingram. This is something called x.ai. Um, and Andrew schedules all of my meetings for me. So all I have to do, if you write me an email, which I welcome you to do, and you say, I'd like to set up a time to talk, I write back. I say, sure, no problem. Andrew, can you get something on my calendar? I CC this bot from x.ai that has access to my calendar. The bot corresponds with you, so I don't have to, no offense, um, and gets something on my calendar, sends you my contact information for how to connect. So I use this all the time, and it saves me a lot of hassle. Um, this is a fun one. This is from uh, SFMOMA. Yeah. Do you mind if we just interrupt you? Yeah, please. Um, Small so group. Like, Let's do it. And so Andrew, like, what does he know about yeah, so much, right? <laughs> um, yeah. Yeah. So it's, how does he know not to, you know, put you back to back or that you want to get out? You, know, you don't want anything at 4:30 because you have to right. catch the train at 4:45 or whatever it is. Right. So you have to invest some time filling out your preferences on the X.AI site. Right, so I, you can say things like, "Oh, I need a 15 buffer, 15 minute buffer between any meetings. Um, schedule all meetings as calls unless I say otherwise." Um, I, I get he so he right it <laughs> let's say it um, has access both to my calendar. It's integrated with I think Google Calendar, iCal, and probably like the Microsoft Office, whatever that is. Um, so access to my calendar to check and make sure that I'm not blocked. But then also I give it Windows, which is my preferred meeting times. I'm a better person in the afternoon generally, <laughs> so I tend to take my meetings then. Um, and so. That's, he immediately sends out suggested times within a couple of seconds of me is, is sending out the email. Like, oh, you're, you know, you're in this location. Yes. It's going to take you X number of minutes to get to your next place. So yes. You yes. Yeah. And what I, what, the reason I got really interested, and they have a great blog if you're interested in, in how they're doing what they do. Um, but the reason I was really interested in this initially, too, is they're looking at the language in your email to determine the formality of the relationship. 
So if I am like, hey, dude, no prob, let's set up a time, <laughs> then um, it infers that this is a casual relationship and uses more casual language. If I write an email and I say, like, thank you so much, you know, please, at your convenience, allow me to blah, blah, blah. You know, if I'm, if I'm acting formal, the bot infers that it's a formal relationship and uses more formal language in the interaction as well. Um, so it does get tripped up. This is not a perfect system. Um, it also fools people almost all of the time unless I explicitly say it's a bot. And so sometimes I get into trouble because people will send the bot materials for the meeting or, um, or, say, or say, like, looking forward to seeing you there, Andrew. <laughs> or, you know, so they think Andrew's also going to be at the meeting. It's a little confusing. So, I've, so I now, like, flag that this is a bot and you know when I when I CC so that people are not and given my job it's not that weird. <laughs> um, so um, any more questions about this one? Yeah. Is it Andrew for everybody or can I give it a name? You can choose a Amy or Andrew. Ingram. Ingram is the last name of the bot. Just, wow, yeah. Okay. Yes. Any other questions about Andrew or Amy? I always choose male assistants because why not, you know? Okay. Um, this one is uh, a bot out of SF MoMA. Really interesting because their collection, they only have a very small percentage of their permanent collection on display in the museum at any time. So this is kind of one of those serendipity bots where I was here just testing emojis. Um, to see what it, would, <laughs> what it would return. But you can use text as well. But you text the bot, and you say, hey, send me clowns, send me cows. And it looks in their permanent art collection and sends you a piece of art. So this is a really fun sort of I'm stuck in the Starbucks line thing to do um, that just adds a little bit of fun into my day. Because I also like art, right? Um, this is another one of my <laughs> this is another one of my favorites. Um, this is called Tiny Carebot. It lives in Twitter. I follow it, and occasionally it just sends me nice little notes, <laughs> right? Like sit up straight, don't forget to breathe. Have you looked outside recently? Um, and so when I'm on Twitter and I'm feeling rageful as I usually do on Twitter, um, these are nice little breaks in the stream. Um, Tiny Carebot. There are also, if, and again, I'm a total bot nerd, so if you would like any more recommendations, there's also like queer theory bot, which is really good, that mashes up interesting fake uh, queer theory. Um, there's a wonderful bot called Boy Bye Bot, um, which is done by uh, Hassan Ali, uh, and it's a phone number that you can give um, guys you don't actually want to text with, <laughs> and the bot texts with, these guys instead, and there is a <laughs> and there is a rich archive of the texts online, and they are truly hilarious. Um, so, go check those out. So, what what are we talking about when we say bot? Right? I think bot is a really hard thing for some to wrap their minds around because it, it means so many different things. Um, if you ask Google, <laughs> I did this this morning and I was so pleased <laughs> with what Google said. So if you say Google, what's a bot? Um, it says it's the larva of the bot fly. So a definition I didn't know until this morning. Um, but you know, for, for us, when I, when I think about bot, I'm thinking about something that automates a process. Bot is really so general, because people use it for things like Alexa, which is a, is a robust piece of software. right? It's an entire operating system and interface. And people use it for something like Tiny Carebot, which is really just like spitting out tweets from a database. right? But the thing that binds this together is this idea of automation in some shape or form. Um, so within the bot universe, I think of this idea of push, of pull, and some that are a mixture of both. So Tiny Carebot is a push bot. All it does is it sends out those tweets. It's not really asking for interaction. 538 did a great election bot that every time their forecast model updated, they sent out a little notification. It also sat on their live blog that evening, posted updates there. 
pull bots are the opposite, right? They're designed to collect information. So sometimes this is something that's done internally. A bot can crawl a website and bring you back information. It's collecting, right? Um, ProPublica is doing some really interesting bot experiments where they're using this to pull information from their audience. Can we help? Can this help our reporting process in some way? They have a Facebook bot now um, that is pulling uh, information about hate speech or reported hate crimes on Facebook, right? And all that bot is doing is pulling information from you and bringing it back to ProPublica, who will follow up at some later date. Um, and then there's this area of both, right? Some sort of extended interaction that you might have with a bot. And this is my deep love at the moment, is thinking about how you do storytelling and content in dialogue form. And so the trick is understanding how and where to pull in the AI or the automation and a sort of deep understanding of the users that you're interacting with to be able to predict or think through both what they might say, right? But then you're really only in control of one side of the dialogue. So we'll talk about this in a few minutes. So why would we want to do this? Um, when I first joined Quartz about six months ago, I was so excited and I went and talked to uh, a bunch of people in editorial and the number one question I got was, but why would anybody want to chat with a bot, <laughs> right? Um, so some of the examples, I think, up there of the, the way I, I use bots in my life, if they're useful to me, that's really great. Um, one, one reason that we're really interested in this is because you can go where people already are. Um, it is a hard sell, as I think we all know, in the world of social media uh, where we're really like trying to go into Twitter and like grab you and be like, come to our website. We have this great website, come over here. Um, or we're in Facebook saying like, hey, Facebook people, have you, have you seen this website we have over here? Um, you know, it's, it's, it's interesting to go where people are. Um, but I also think about this idea in social media that what we're doing is one to many, right? We have this message, we have this piece of content, and we're sort of putting it out there to all of these different people. When we're doing chats, we're doing it in a private space. It's one to one communication, but we're doing it at scale. And machines can keep really good track of conversations with individuals. And it's interesting to me because it's intimate, it's private. Whatever they say to you, they don't say publicly on Twitter. It's a space where an audience member, a reader, a viewer, a listener, a user, whatever you want to call them, where that person can say something to you and expect to have it stay in that one little channel, right? And so it's a more personal experience too then. We can tailor our content to the individual. We can um, get better at understanding your preferences and your behavior in interesting ways. Um, and if we go to where people are, and believe me, I understand the other side of the argument I'm making here, but if we go to where people are, we also have reach all of a sudden, right? We, ha we can access a huge audience, and I would argue that it's better to try to get that audience and stay within the platform that you're, that you're operating in. So engagement, that's what I've been talking about. Um, you know, at Quartz, they talk about writing at the intersection of what's interesting and what's important. I think when you're in the product landscape or when you're talking about bots in general, I would add a third. <laughs> um, I would add a third circle to this because it needs to be useful. It needs to do something for your audience, your reader, your lead, you know, listener, all of those people. Um, because if you're not if you're not doing something for your audience, why would they spend time interacting with you, right? So I think it's really important to think about how to be useful. Um, so what does that mean? It means filling a need. So here are two other bots that I um, love. I'm not pregnant, by the way, um, but I do think the midwife bot is really interesting because it fills a need. Um, it both pushes content 
in, <laughs> that's a bad pun, um, <laughs> but it both pushes content to users in, um, you know, along the sort of typical, oh, you're 12 weeks pregnant um, cycle, but it also is there for users when they have a specific need. So if I were to type to the midwife bot, am I allowed to eat broccoli? It tells me yes. If I say, am I allowed to eat sushi? It says no. If I say, what's this weird feeling I'm having? <laughs> right? it, tries to, it tries to answer those questions and to point you to the correct resources. And this feels more private to me than typing secrets into Google, right? Um, I mean, it's not because it's Facebook, right? It's, it's definitely, I'm not saying Facebook is a private place. Um, I'm saying that the feeling of that channel is more private because you are one-on-one. -on -one. Um, delight and entertain. This is the part where I get to embarrass myself. Get ready. Um, so delight and entertain, I think, is another place that, sh that chatbots really shine. If you can surprise your users and engage them in interesting ways, you have won them. Um, so this is an interesting uh, example from Nat Geo, National Geographic, uh, when they put out Oh, it failed because I can't remember the name of the TV show. Oh, Genius. I think it was actually called Genius. But it was about Albert Einstein. They were promoting this series. And so they built a bot where you could chat with Albert Einstein. And he was sort of this like stodgy character. <laughs> um, and it was, it was a lot of fun. This is the embarrassing slide. Are you ready? Also, there's a Christian Grey chatbot <laughs> that was produced to promote Fifty Shades of Grey. Um, I'm going to chat with him here uh, and show you. Um, so this is a promotional tool for Fifty Shades of Grey or whatever the next movie was called. Um, he's the character who, I guess, like ties people up and stuff. Um, so. It was really effective, though, right? Like the interactions with this thing felt genuine in a way. Like in in some ways, it's it's like a good, you know, if if a bot is going to interact with you, it it's easy for this character to do it because it can like ignore you and tell you to shut up and be kind of mean and. Um, so it was an interesting um, experiment. But you might think about how media could create experiences where you are assuming a character. What could we do that's experiential to try to put you um, in those places? So one of the things that we're talking about for next year or that we're trying to um, think about is you know, when we think about gender, when we think about bias, could we put together something really experiential like this to show you bias or to demonstrate, to put you in a situation where you're having to choose words to respond to a situation and then look at the words that you're using and help you understand how words might be gendered or not, depending on the situation. So how are we doing this? Um, I'm going to show you some of our work and show you some of our experiments. Um, so from Quartz, so the reason that, you know, or the, a lot of people think of us as this app, right? And this app um, is a standalone app. You can chat in the sense that you can choose a couple of buttons. We write the news in a conversational way. Um, it's really a, f a fun, engaging way to consume the news. But it's not, the only thing that's automated is like that we send you the text, <laughs> right? Um, there's a team of writers and editors working on this and writing this every day and doing all of these pushes. Um, so, oh, that's my reminder to go to the internet um, instead of slides. So we're trying to build on the success of the app um, and go a little deeper with interaction and understand how people want to interact with um, news and information and stories. So let me show you what we're up to. So this is QuackBot. Kurt gave me our little, <laughs> we gave these out at ONA um, last week. There's a little logo for QuackBot. Um, so QuackBot is uh, a suite of tools for journalists. 
that lives inside Slack. So if your organization uses Slack, if you're unfamiliar, Slack is a messaging platform that um, many media companies and other companies use for internal communication. Um, so this is my actual Slack, <laughs> so you can see um, some of my channels lit up here on the left. But Quackbot lives inside Slack both for Quartz and we've open sourced the tools for anybody else who wants to use them in partnership with Document Cloud. Um, and what we were trying to do here is to understand what the needs are for a newsroom. So for example, uh, when we talked to our data editor, um, he was saying, gosh, you know, so often what I do, people know that my title is data editor and I am here to help, but you know, so many times a week people just slack me and they say, hey Chris, do you know any data for like death in Alabama? And he's like, oh, sure, you know, and he, and he helps them find that data. Um, so we decided to automate Chris <laughs> in a way as part of what we do in, um, in Quackbot so that you can ask Quackbot for data on a given topic and Quackbot searches a, a list of data that was vetted by our data editor. So this is the long list of data sources. It searches this and suggests data sources and links you to the actual thing. Um, the other thing you can do, let's see, it's got four functions right now. We're gonna keep adding to it over time. This is an article I wrote about um, Alexa and my children. Um, so I can say, uh, check this for cliches. And it pulls up the article. Oh, am I not chatting with Quackbot? No, I am. Oh, it takes a minute to wake up. So once it gets going, it'll, it'll get back to me. Hello, Quackbot, are you there? Yeah, there she is, all right. So scanning for cliches and hopefully, ha ha ha, yes. I don't know why I'm getting double messages. We will investigate later. <laughs> Live demos are always terrible. Um, but I have zero cliches on the website. The other thing I can do is I can save a URL to the Internet Archive. So if you want to archive a web page at a particular moment in time, you can ask Quackbot to do that for you. Um, it'll take a screenshot of an entire website. So you know how it's hard to kind of cobble together screenshots <laughs> sometimes? So Quackbot can do that for you and we'll spit the image back to you. Um, these are four of the functionalities that we had identified as being immediately useful that we could build in the amount of time that we had. We're gonna be rolling out more over time. But what we're trying to do really is um, fill a need for people in newsrooms, and it's all open source, so it's free, the code is free, you're welcome to contribute if you would like to contribute to the code. Um, and then we also sort of built in just some fun, like, I'm bored, Quackbot. Um, let's see if he's gonna cooperate. Come on, internet, anyway, you can chat with him. Oh yeah, there we go. Um, so <laughs> the bot will chat with you about random stuff as well. That's not the function of the bot, but we did want to give the bot some personality. So if you do chat with Quackbot, there are lots of duck jokes <laughs> involved um, at various times. So um, the other, the quartz directory, why is that up? Oh, I just opened it, okay. Um, one of the things that we soft launched um, this morning and I was trying to fix it <laughs> as we did, um, is we're playing around with um, sort of lifestyle coverage right now. We have this new brand called Quartzy that's launching um, sometime in November. It's, it exists now as a newsletter, it exists now as um, a Facebook community, uh, but will be an entirely new edition of Quartz that, that will be um, coming in sometime in November. So we've been experimenting with bots in sort of the lifestyle area on the Quartzy website. So um, is anybody here a Stranger Things fan or has watched Stranger Things? A few of you, okay. Um, so we made a Stranger Things bot. It's just a little Easter egg right now on our um, Facebook page. So you can chat with this bot about TV. Right now, it's just a series of um, buttons. You can try to type things, but it's not very smart yet. Um, but we'll be building out more of this 
as we go. Um, we'll be adding to the content over the next few weeks, and um, we will watch season two alongside you. So why would we want to do this? Um, you know, A, I think it's a really fun way to think about TV, um, is this idea of sort of a pop culture companion. Um, and when Netflix sort of dumps all episodes at once, it's nice to have someone, something, <laughs> that you can talk to about those episodes immediately based on your progress as well. Um, so we made this, um, sure. We made this catch-up bot for right now, and then we'll be rolling things out. All right, I won't spoil the season for any of you, but I would encourage you, if you are interested, to go and <laughs> type with my bot, and I will learn from it. I was saying this morning, like, I made this perfectly lovely bot, and then people went and tried to talk to it, and now it's all broken, um, because people behave unpredictably all the time, and um, I had anticipated a number of things that people might say to get this going when they first messaged the bot, and I was only about 50% accurate this morning when it went live in our editorial stream, and everybody started <laughs> texting the bot. Um, yeah, yeah. So um, how much is it, obviously you have to fix it yourself in certain ways, how much is it able to learn on its own? So this bot, yeah, so it's, it is not a sentient bot at this point. Um, it is not learning or fixing itself. Um, we will be playing with that over time. Um, and we have deep analytics running to help us understand the way people are using it, where they jump out of it, where they you know, get confused. Um, but the other thing that we're doing is trying to um, trying to kind of bridge this balance between editorial and AI, basically. Um, so we're using an NLP engine for this. I will show you guys. I'll make a bot like in two seconds and show you how it's done. Um, but we're using we're using an NLP engine to help us understand what people are saying. And then on the editorial side, we are waiting for the call to come back and tell us, yeah, it was a good thing or a bad thing, <laughs> right? So at that moment in, in the bot, we're saying like, okay, we just asked a question. Is this, is what they say positive? Is what they say negative? Or is what they say off topic? If it's off topic, is it on another topic that we know about? Or is this like a truly random thing that we don't understand and we should throw an error message? Um, so right now we're sort of straddling both. We're not confident at the stage of sort of content generation. Um, and we're, so we don't trust it to actually um, do that routing. But the NLP engine does get smarter and can be trained based on the data here. So if it's making errors, it will get better at fielding those, but our bot itself, sort of the infrastructure, is not learning on its own. Does that make sense? Cool. All right, this is my work account, so you can see all of my, all of my chats. Um, okay, cool. So we have about 15 minutes left, so I'll just show you. Um, this is for anybody who's interested in going and creating a bot. I'm trying to decide whether I should tell you it's easy. <laughs> um, it, it, it can be easy to create a bot. In fact, to just do a very simple bot, it's very easy. Um, if you want the bot to get smart, that's where things become complicated. <laughs> so if you wanted to do something like an FAQ bot, right, that it answers a set number of questions, um, this could be really easy for you. If you want to do complex navigation based on things people type, this is totally capable of handling that, but you do sort of have to level up in terms of your um, understanding of how machines work. Um, so this is called Run Dexter. Um, this is the platform that we are using. I spent a month of my life testing every bot making tool I could find out there. A, because we wanted to be able to answer the question that we typically get in these settings, which is like, how would I get started? So I tested tons of them, and my eye twitches every time I talk about it. Um, and 
we also wanted to come up with uh, an internal system for how bots get made, and we wanted to see if there were any tools that we thought were robust enough to uh, be useful to us. So this is actually what we've found and are using. It's called Run Dexter. Yes. Sorry, I get another one. Is this yeah. specifically for, for making Facebook bots, or is that language sort of applicable to lots of different venues where bots can live? Exactly. Yeah. It's it's multi-platform, so you can publish to Slack, you can publish to Facebook, you can publish to Twitter. Uh, Twilio for SMS messaging. Um, it has, and they're adding more as they go. Um, if you go to the broadcast or platforms tab, then you can see, and they walk you through the setup process there. Um, so Dexter, we really liked because it's actually not drag and drop. Um, my problem, so the way that we did this is I, I wrote a script. The script was about Beyonce because I thought, you know, if robots had a wish, it would probably be to talk about Beyonce. Um, so I wrote a script about Beyonce and tried to put that script into all of these different platforms to see how quickly I could do it, what was possible, what wasn't. Um, and I really found that all of the menus and the buttons and the drop downs and like it's really slowed me down. Um, so there are tools out there. Chat Fuel is a really popular one. Um, but I did not find it expedient <laughs> as an editor to actually go in and make a thing, right? So um, Dexter is built on top of what's called ReeveScript, which is a bot scripting language, which means it has a lot of power. Um, you can script here. You can send out calls to various APIs. Um, it has webhook integrations. Um, you can do JavaScript macros inside Dexter, if my eye is switching again when I say JavaScript macros. Um, so it has a lot of functionality if you did want to build something really robust. It's all ready to, um, to take you there. So the way it works, I'll see you a little demo here, is a plus sign is something a user might say. So I might say, hi. And then the bot would say, hello, right? OK, so it has a phone over here that I can use to test this. So if I say, hi, the bot says, hello. Um, so immediately, you might start to get a hint of the problems, right? So I've said hi, but think about the number of ways a person can say hello to someone, <laughs> right? Hi, hey, what's up? You know, this morning people were typing things like, yo, Quartzia, I hear you know about Stranger Things. And we're like, ugh. Why are you typing so much? Um, so there are ways to do this um, simply, and there are ways to do this um, in a more complex way, right? So if I wanted to try to capture some of those possibilities, I could say, hi, hello, hey, sup, what's up, how you, you know, whatever I wanted to think about that users could say, I could put it here. It's a lot of work to go through and think about all of those things. So now if I said, sup, hey, I can test all of those here, and they do work. But you find yourself in a situation where you are trying to guess <laughs> what users will say. Um, and that's where it's really useful to hook into something like an NLP engine. NLP, by the way, natural language processing is what I'm talking about when I say <laughs> NLP. And the way that that um, engine works is it has learned over time sort of what is the full corpus of things people could say, the ways that they could say hello. And so you sort of take the text and you send it over to the engine and then it comes back as a single sort of intent or trigger where you say, okay, something like hello, right? And then you can trigger your response. Um, but on the fly, just type that stuff in. And then as people use your bot and you discover new ways that people say hello, you can just add <laughs> over time. Um, so what's really useful, too, is some kind of trigger. So let's say someone says anything. So that's the wild card. So you can say, oops, don't get it. I'm a bot, right? So if I said, what's on the sked for Thurs? It would say, I don't know. And I could type anything at this point, and it would give me that response. Um, so what's really useful for people who are beginning with bots is to offer people some kind of option. So within Dexter, 
you can say, oops, buttons. Um, let's see. Oh, gosh, I hadn't thought through what I would type here. <laughs> um, weather, sports, you know, whatever you would want to say here. So here I would create triggers for weather and sports. Sports is a thing people like involves balls. Um, weather, it's nice out, right? So now if I type hi, I will get these two options, right? Hello, and would you like to talk about weather or sports? I can choose one of those, it'll reroute to the trigger, right? So this, again, can be as complex or as simple <laughs> as you make it. Um, but I would really encourage you guys to go and play with some of these things because it's really interesting just on a level of what it, of, I feel like my understanding of human behavior has changed fundamentally from doing this work. Um, the way people behave unpredictably, the sort of richness of language, it's really interesting. Um, and I mean, you know, my friend Ariana at ProPublica was joking that the first rule of bots is people will mess with your bot. Um, and so you need to have strategies, too, to sort of take those users who are trying to trick you and just get them back on track. Um, people talk about personality with bots and how you need to have a lot of voice and a lot of um, you know, attitude. Think about, think about, do you guys ever talk to Siri? No? Zero people? Uh, okay, a couple of you do. Siri has a lot of attitude. And I don't know if you can hear it in my voice, but I have feelings about her now, right? I have emotions about Siri, and they're negative. <laughs> um, because of the number of times that I've tried to talk to her, and the number of times that she both is doing something that I don't want her to do with sass, <laughs> right? Like, she, she has an attitude when she's messing up which makes me rage as a person. That's who I am. Um, and so for me, I, you know, when, when we're doing error handling, so to give you the counter example, so Alexa, so let's take Siri versus Alexa. So Siri, if you say something like, oh, Siri, you suck, she's like, oh, you know, she does that kind of, um, like, Emily, your language. She says that sometimes. Um, and if I say, Alexa, you suck, she says, sorry, thank you for the feedback. And it makes me feel like I've kicked my dog. Like, it makes me feel terrible and guilty. And I, like, examine who I am as a person for insulting a robot, right? So there are, there are ways that you can play with user interaction to great success or to great um, detriment for your brand and your product. Um, but, you know, when we are error handling, so when we when a user throws us something that we don't know what to do, that is when we are our most muted in personality, right? We're just trying to say, we're a bot, we're messing up, we, sorry, <laughs> we don't understand, right? But when things are going well, that's when you really see our personality come out and shine in these various, um, in these various places. Because two, you know, there's, there's a danger there. The more uh, sort of candy you put into a bot, the more people will try to find it, right? Um, and so if your bot is not really designed to be very conversational, um, you should build that expectation with your users. Um, I was just telling Kurt beforehand, this is actually a misgiving I have about our current state of the Stranger Things bot. Um, I'm sort of questioning our use of this NLP engine right now to handle small talk because the bot, if you say hi, it'll say hi. If you say I'm bored, it'll say, you know, try, try reading our website. <laughs> um, but I, I think that sort of encourages people to stray from the path, because we've created these very careful paths through content, right? And so we're trying, we like are like, yeah, we're good, but why don't you come back over here? OK, nice thought, but like, come back <laughs> over here. And to me, I think maybe we shouldn't be doing the random response at all if we're not actually editorially equipped to handle it, 
right? So you will see me struggle with that live in the next um, in the next few weeks as the as the Stranger Things bot gets off the ground. Um, any questions at this point about Dexter, about the bots? Anything? Yeah. How easy is it then once you've built the corpus of responsive theory mm -hmm. on Dexter to plug that into Slack or Facebook Messenger? Very easy. It really is. The actual, I mean, we, we've sort of joked that like the Facebook, like hooking it up to Facebook was the hardest thing we did. Um, that wasn't totally true because then we found all these bugs that we hadn't fixed when we were saying that yet. Um, but the, yeah, the, the Facebook integration, Facebook is really clunky anyway. I'll just say that as a blanket statement. I think Facebook is really clunky in terms of its UI. Um, so on the Facebook side, in the developer portal, there are things that just are not totally clear, um, but really, really smooth for, for most of the other platforms. And Facebook is totally doable, obviously. It just takes, a, takes more attention than, than most. Yeah? So then you guys aren't like, um, paying like, third party organizations to operate your bots. You're just doing them all through Dexter, and it's free. And then so Dexter is free to a point. Um, so if you are serving like thousands and thousands of users, there's there's a scale right. for supporting that. But you're the one who's doing all of the building. Yes. So yeah, the way that we actually build in Dexter is we don't use Dexter, <laughs> um, really. Um, we are so we are just. Um, we're using just a code editor, a text editor. We're building an Atom. We push our changes to GitHub. GitHub talks to Dexter, updates Dexter. Dexter talks to Facebook. So most of my, I won't, I'm not going to open my code editor. That's too much. Um, but you know, it's, it's the same thing as if I was like copying all of my code and pasting it into Dexter. But I wanted the, I wanted the sort of development environment personally. Um, on my machine, but I could have done it all here. Yeah. So I'm wondering, are you making things as, like the bot, as human as possible? So like, if you're talking like this, like you wouldn't expect someone to say hello, like weather, sports. And so is it, <laughs> yeah. is it to trick them to think they're talking to humans, make it as nice as a robot conversation can be? And then also I'm just thinking like, when you get these automated responses, it's immediate. But when you're talking with a human, you expect to see, you know, dot, 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 mm -hmm. or some time in between. So you think about that when you're creating these two? Yeah, we absolutely do. Um, and there are some, um, some time delays in here. So you can, you know, so I can set that up um, here. So if I wanted to, I would say delay seconds equals two. Um, any, any, oops, anything else? Right. So I can insert delays where you see like that typing, typing, typing thing. Um, so a couple of things. One, I, I also spent like months and months and months chatting with like every bot I could find. Um, and what I actually found was that um, I very much preferred talking to like uh, an animal or some kind of persona um, than I did with a brand logo. Uh, because on some level, I was like, what does it mean to chat with Whole Foods? Like, how does that, that doesn't, that doesn't really register. Like, I imagine myself standing outside of a Whole Foods and being like, hey, do you have kale? Um, so, you know, I, I think I preferred um, Any time there was like like Poncho is a cat, right? And so it also sort of opens the door. You're already like in a weird space where you're chatting with a bot, and so you sort of this is suspension of belief of sus hmm, suspension of belief. Is that what I'm saying? Yes, kicks in and of disbelief. Thank you. <laughs> suspension of disbelief kicks in where then you kind of accept that you're talking to a cat, right? And in some ways, that's easier for me to buy into than a brand or um, 
even like a robot person <laughs> sometimes. Um, so you know, all of our all of our tests, we actually had this like little hippo character <laughs> that we were using. His name is Botopotamus because that's what I named him. Um, but it also allows you to, in the writing, kind of have fun. So like Quackbot believes itself to be a duck, right? <laughs> um, so. You know, we, we never want to trick people to have them think that they're talking to humans, but we're also thinking about doing some experiments in this space, um, in the Quartzy space, where um, the bot modules are authored, right? So like you could do something with one of the writers, um, and we'll see how We'll see how that goes. But I never want to trick people into thinking that they're humans. But we're very interested in playing with this um, time idea in terms of response. But it's a double-edged sword because if people know they're talking to a bot, they expect you to reply <laughs> right, right away. Um, they're more forgiving of humans, but we are not human, not really. So yeah. So I have a lot of, uh, a lot of questions. And this um, online news association, I, th I don't know if you went to Amy Webb's presentation. I know you were at I did not. Domine, but it was really um, a fascinating discussion about the zero UI environment and transparency. Hmm. And like, we're working on a bot um, at the Franklin Institute, but it got me thinking about the things that she was saying is if we think that getting people to source and for journalism entities to be transparent about sources is hard now, in this environment, it's next to impossible because when people, they want this conversation, they don't want, as was stated in the New York Times on February 4th, 1992, the weather is nice. Mm. And so what you start to do is strip away the ability to dig deeper or source, and people just kind of believe what they get. So, and, and it was just an interesting thing I hadn't really thought about, which was how, as we're moving into this chat zero UI, how do you bring that important of importance of trust, it seems to me like in a chatbot environment, trust would actually be increased because it feels more private, hmm. it's anthropomorphized, but at the same time, how do you know you're talking to your wife? How do you know that information is accurate and it hasn't been subverted by someone? Um, so I don't know, it, it, I just, I'd be curious on your perspectives of that and how much that plays into your a lot, right? So, um, so two things. One, we always make available at any time information about the bot, right? Who are you? What is this? Are you a bot? Help. All of that stuff will work, and it leads you to um, a, a fairly sophisticated like help environment where we're ready to answer a lot of the questions that you're talking about. Um, you know, the other thing that we so. You know, in the Quartz app, we do um, we do sourcing with like a bubble, and then there's a little uh, like source thing right underneath the bubble, which means that you can click through to the original piece wherever that piece was. Um, so that's a way to do it. We've also run some experiments, um, not in uh, so so when I was doing um, some of the prototypes for what ended up being Stranger Things. Um, we also are really interested in being able to access this contextual layer, right? So thinking about the questions that people might ask around a given topic, if we know that you're in a topic about X and you say, like, says who? Where'd you get that? Um, any of that type of language, we can also answer, right? It's not part of the main experience necessarily, but is this context that's available around the experience so that if you do have questions, right, um, we, those are available. That's in sort of an open source environment, where, or not open source, open response environment where people can type. Um, we also included in some of these early mocks buttons that actually said things like says who, right? according to who, right? Um, and providing that as an option that you could go into if you were curious about the sourcing of information. So I think there are options. I think the, one of the biggest questions, though, is um, how much you need to feed that and have it be in the sentence to start with versus being accessible sort of at this, on the side, right? So that's hard. I think it's way harder when there is no screen. Right, um, so like we, I had this up in case you guys were curious about Alexa. Um, we did this A-B testing um, 
these are actually two, these aren't the exact A to B. Um, it's not the same content. We did A-B testing for, we abandoned this project, by the way. We, um, we have no real faith at this moment that people want to talk to Alexa for a while. Um, so even though we built this and we user tested and people loved it and we were going to make it, I just had this sort of gut feeling that people don't want to talk to Alexa for more than like a question and answer, right? It just it doesn't feel like the right environment to me. It doesn't feel like um, the right context. I think maybe once Alexa is in your ears, maybe once she's in the car, maybe she maybe in those places you would want to have an extended interaction. But right now in your kitchen, who's gonna like stop and sit next to this weird cylinder and be like? Okay, Alexa, tell me everything, right? Nobody. So, um, so, we, so we killed this. Um, but what was interesting about this experiment, we did this A-B testing, and um, people, <laughs> people um, s reported that, so the A-B test was um, one is Alexa reading the news, and one is sort of like a podcast-style voice delivery. Um, we put it in... The concept was um, global news, so stories you aren't likely to have heard before, sort of curiosity stories from around the globe, um, and in quiz form, where the quiz is kind of a joke, right? So um, I don't know if I have audio here, but I can try to turn it up. But um, you know, so like item two, category: baby animals, specifically baby animals trying not to die. Question. What animal whispers to its mother to avoid detection by predators? A lion. So that was one. Um, over here, you had um, For a voice. For question two, we're moving eastward to Switzerland, where the season is a lot shorter because of climate change. So that was the test. Um, and people reported, people reported that they enjoyed the audio much more, listening to a human talk. Um, but people emoted, we recorded these, we videotaped them, and people emoted far more with Alexa. Big smiles, laughing. Like if you watched a version of our user testing where you had no audio and just watched people, you would say, oh, they absolutely prefer Alexa, <laughs> right, to, um, to sort of a radio style presentation. So, um, so that was really interesting, but sourcing here really, really slows down the flow. It slows down the flow both for people who are talking and it slows down for Alexa because she talks much more slowly than people do. So for her to stop and like do these clauses, you know, according to Centers for Disease Control, you know, that, like that really impedes your understanding of the information. So Why when do you think they emoted more? Just because we find it amusing that thoughts and other things, or that we still kind of I, I found myself and just when you saying that we just got an Alexa for our office, and every time she does something so basic, we're like, oh my god, that's amazing, you know, and she sings like Happy Birthday. Oh, like, I know she does. Phenomenal. Yeah. <laughs> I think it's because we're so that we, I, I just was trying, why did we react that way? <laughs> yeah, I think like our hypothesis was like, it's just funny to hear a robot say stuff. Right. Like it's yeah. just funny. And if you can make her say ridiculous things, even better, right? It's, so we were writing to that effect, right? It's funny to hear her say baby animals trying not to die or whatever. Um, and so I think it was that. And we did think that novelty was a part of that, and that over time, people, like it would wear off, right? That you, but, but you know, moreover, you have to have a, you have to be paying much closer attention to that type of delivery um, when it's talking, because it's not just normal cadence that you're used to. Um, and so it, it requires a more careful attention um, and that's really the piece that we thought was a deal breaker because we don't think careful attention is something that people are giving this device at this moment in their homes. Yeah, okay. Um, so this has been a little winding. That's okay. Um, we have a couple more minutes. Um, this is our internet email address. <laughs> so if you would like to get in touch, we're bots at qz.com. Um, documentcloud.org forward slash quackbot is where you can get quackbot if you want to install it 
at your organization. Um, this is the URL that will get you to the Stranger Things bot. Um, stay tuned in that space because it's, it will evolve. Um, that's me. And I'm happy to answer any other questions that you guys have about bots, about creation, about the studio, about how you should get started. Anything else? Why are most bots women? <laughs> Why do you think? <laughs> right. Um, so this was, this was um, an interesting thing that happened in our editorial Slack, right? So we have, so the answer of why most bots are women is because when people want servants, they want young sounding women, right? Like, that's just who we are as people. Um, and so most bots have this sort of younger sounding voice. And there's some really great reading out there if you're interested more in like gender of robots. There's tons of really great work out there about this. But it does have to do with um, bots being mostly assistants or servants in our life right now. And we want young women in those roles. Yeah, sorry. Um, it's true. I mean, I knew the answer, but I had yeah. So, um, so that's, that's that. And then, so there's a separate product. Um, so the, the news, br uh, the, the flash briefing on Alexa is where all the news delivery happens. And we weren't happy with what was happening for our news cast. Um, it was Alexa reading it. And so we went through this other, um, we went through this other Amazon service called Polly, which has a bunch of different voices. And as soon as they put it in this like distinguished male British voice, everyone was like, oh, that's fabulous. It just sounds great, et cetera. And I was like, hey, do you think you could be preferring the older distinguished British male version of this because it's news delivery, and so you are automatically sort of extending trust to this voice versus the young female voice, right? Like, how does that environment, do your expectations for the robot shift according to the environment, right? I think that's a really interesting question. Um, we ended up going with um, two different voices that go back and forth, like a newscast for our, for our um, flash briefing. But, um, but yeah, I have, so I am also a professor at Northwestern University, and I have a student who's um, going to run an experiment, I think, next year to investigate this idea of trust in robot voices, because <laughs> there's been a lot around like the service component. But to see if our, if our sort of gender um, our socialized gender norms, if we project those as well. Yeah, because we're building up like a science information bot, and it's like I hate to say it, but Morgan Freeman and David Attenborough, are like, are, who are you? Who are you most likely to learn from? Hmm. And then it also reversing that, can bots also help? From what you were saying, retrain people, like to trust, you know, to start to see gender stereotypes differently. It puts. It, there's a lot of yeah. Yeah, it's a really interesting. Space. Any other questions? Okay, well, thanks for listening. It's been fun.